Smith's offer a way to add more value, care, savings for your residents, but also can bring in some long-term strategic benefits for your senior living organization, as well as, in many cases, some real monetary value. You're listening to The Senior Advisor, a WTW podcast series where we'll discuss issues facing the senior living industry and explore risk management solutions, hot topics, and important trends critical to senior living operations. Welcome to The Senior Advisor podcast. My name is Rhonda Debino. I am thrilled to be your host for this podcast series. This series is intended to bring you firsthand information on trends and hot topics facing the senior living industry. This is the third episode of our three-part series addressing senior living special needs plans. This episode is titled Preparing for Special Needs Programs and the Future of Care in Senior Living. We'll focus on the regulatory structure, compliance, and we will have Our panelists provide an actual case study of a special needs advantage um, program and how it really benefited the senior living community. I'd like to introduce you to our distinguished panel. Uh, Today we have with us Penny White. Penny is the North America Managed Care Practice Leader for WTW, um, and he is part of the Healthcare Practice Group. He joined WTW in 2014. We're thrilled to have Penny on board with us to share all of his knowledge and his um, expertise. So welcome, Kenny. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much for inviting me. And we also have Amy Kazak. Amy is the Executive Vice President of Strategic Initiatives for Toronto Health. Amy is a value-based payment veteran with over 25 years of developing innovative payment and care models for high-risk patient populations. Welcome, Amy. So happy to have you. Thanks, Rhonda. Looking forward to the conversation. My introduction to these panelists did not even give a least little bit of credit for their long list of credentials. So if any of you are interested in finding out more about our panelists today, feel free to visit our podcast page where you'll be able to really obtain their bios and their deep level of knowledge and expertise on the topic of ISNIP. So to begin our conversation today, um, our previous series focused on emerging care solutions for senior living operators. We talked about that in, in episode two. We, we, we really went into some great detail with Dr. Cheryl Phillips on our um, previous episode, episode number one. But today we're gonna get in the weeds a bit at, as we continue to explore special needs plans and how these plans can prepare senior living operators and be utilized for future senior care solutions. So with that said, Amy, let's talk about some of those SIP structures. Can you give us a little bit of information on the structure of a a special needs program? Yes, so just to remind everybody, we are talking about special needs plans, which are Medicare Advantage plans. Um, CMS has three types of specific special needs plans. Typically in senior housing, we're focusing on the ISNP or institutional equivalent special needs plan designed for your resident who are either maybe living in your long-term um, care facility institutional setting um, or who might be living in your assisted living, memory care, or even independent living, but meet the state level of care requirements for institutionalized care. And then CSNAPs or chronic condition special needs plans um, sometimes target specific um, conditions to populations with specific conditions like dementia. Um, So for your assisted living memory care, um, that might be a good fit for that population. And like all Medicare Advantage plans, um, I always say that Medicare Advantage plans are are the original value-based payment program um, for seniors at least. SNFs 
offer a way to add more value, care, savings for your residents, but also can bring in some long-term strategic benefits for your senior living organization, as well as, in many cases, some real monetary value um, to help support what you're already doing today. And that's really good um, information that you shared, Amy. I think uh, operators, senior living operators, I hope that they really understand that there there is a, a benefit for them as well, and it, this is not necessarily a lot of added work if they collaborate with with the right partner on this. So, Kenny, when we're talking about uh, special needs programs or institutional special needs program, what does participating in these programs really mean? Participation from a beneficiary perspective means that you're eligible for Medicare. You meet one of the criteria for one of the, S, the special needs plans that Amy just uh, described for us, uh, and that you have selected or your legal representative has selected for you to receive your benefits through this form of Medicare. From a organizational standpoint, uh, an operator standpoint, it means that you have either a direct contract with CMS as a Medicare Advantage special needs plan, um, which to be frank is relatively rare, that you are a contracted entity with a special needs plan to provide certain services to the special needs plan, or that you have entered into um, a legal arrangement, usually a joint venture with another entity, such as the company that Amy works with, whereby you are providing uh, a chunk of the services, but um, the other partner is providing all of the administrative infrastructure for participation uh, and adding in a lot of things that your organization probably doesn't have uh, as part of the special needs program. But those are the basics of participation. Penny, how do, how do um, individuals know, how do the residents, how are they informed that they are in a plan? I'm going to skip the multiple uh, lawsuits that are spawned by dementia patients uh, knowing anything, but that comes up far more frequently than you would imagine. But generally speaking, just like anything else, anybody that's Medicare eligible has the opportunity to be fee-for-service Medicare. They get a Medicare card, they go see a Medicare participating uh, provider, which is basically pretty much everyone, um, not everyone, but almost everyone. And that therefore those services are billed directly to Medicare and they're paid for in accordance with the Medicare fee schedule. or they can elect to join a Medicare Advantage uh, plan. There are multitudes of them. The vast majority of them are owned by the four or five largest managed care organizations out there. Those are run generally all Part A and Part B services are included. Many of them include Part D services for uh, a fee. Um, not all of them. Then they also, many of them will add vision or dental services in as well some wellness programs, et cetera. Or if you are eligible for Medicare and choose to join a special needs plan, you have to affirmatively join like anything else. Uh, the slamming uh, or the concept of auto enrolling you into a program is uh, illegal, uh, considered fraud and can send you to jail. Uh, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> Moving uh, residents from one MA plan or a uh, special needs plan to another without their authorization is also illegal. That can also end you in jail. So it's an authorized uh, item. There are problems associated when there are uh, powers of attorney involved or family members are bickering uh, or you have a resident who uh, suffers from dementia or Alzheimer's, those kind of things. But generally it's a a requested thing on behalf of the beneficiary. So say a resident does not have an assigned power of attorney or a surrogate, what happens in that case if they meet the criteria and they would really benefit from a plan? How, how do we work through those situations? 
Yeah, so Rhonda, this is where I would say, um, you know, this is part of the power of the specialized special needs plan, um, meaning a an ISNEP or a FACENEP who is really focused on seniors living in congregate senior housing, who understand how the organizations work, but very importantly, who understand the importance of the family, of caregivers, um, and who in some cases even understand uh, the different regulatory processes if there's a guardian who's involved. So organizations like ours, again, we only um, work with residents living in senior living campuses. Um, that's all we do. So our enrollment processes, our information processes, they are all designed to work for seniors who maybe can't advocate for themselves, who can't make decisions for themselves for different reasons. Um, and we understand how to work with um, the senior living teams to contact the right people, what questions need to be asked, um, and then very importantly, how to make sure we're just um, doing outreach and promotion, not just to the resident, but really to what I call their, their kind of extended care team. Good answer. Thank you very much for that. So, Amy, how are senior living communities selected? Or, or are they invited to participate, or do they go out on their own? Well, it, it definitely depends. Um, in some cases, um, especially if you are assisted living, memory care, independent living, or you are not paid directly by Medicare today, you might not be asked to join an ISNIP or a CSNIP ever because uh, there is nothing that says the ISNEP or the FACENET has to contract with you if they are not paying you any dollars. So you may be a senior living organization today and have residents who are already in enrolled in an ISNEP or CSNEP or other Medicare Advantage plan. You don't know about it, you're not engaged in it, and you're, you're not receiving any dollars or additional benefits, at least, um, that you know of. My point here is that I would think about being proactive as you're thinking about um, your future strategy for participating in value-based care. I hear a lot of times that senior living organizations say, I am private pay only. Why do I need to participate in Medicare Advantage? Um, my answer is, if you don't participate today, you might not have the option to participate tomorrow. And we're talking about new dollars um, many times for these senior living organizations. If you're a SNF, you're still going to be paid your Part A, not necessarily new dollars there. Um, but if you're assisted living, memory care, um, independent living, organizations like ours, you recognize the value that you bring to your residents and their health outcomes who make our plan successful, basically, um, we can include you um, and pay you for care coordination services that you are providing for our members. Um, we can pay you when we all achieve quality outcomes, i.e. avoid fewer avoidable hospitalizations, um, fewer falls in your facility. So a lot of ways that you can participate with us, a lot of reasons um, that you might want to. And I would say I would be proactive in seeking out um, a plan who will work with you. We do come sometimes to specific senior living buildings who say, hey, you're in our service area. Would you like to join? Let us tell you about it. So we certainly do that outbound work. But if you haven't heard from an ISNAP um, or a SPSNAP and you're wondering about how to get involved, I would encourage you um, to proactively start reaching out or thinking about options in your market. So, Kenny, good question. I'm thinking about a new resident um, is admitted into the community, and there's a lot of requirements in the residency uh, admission agreement. Um, and since you're the legal guru on this call, would there be a requirement to to have any um, disclosure um, to the resident um, coming into the community? Or is there any work that the community should be doing, um, collecting any type of paperwork to say that this resident is in this plan or that the 
community has residents in a plan and that the resident may be eligible, should there be any type of communication um, on admission? First thing, they don't buy me legal and malpractice insurance anymore, so I'm not permitted to give legal opinions, but that said, most I mean of the to put you in a bad situation, Ken. No, no, that's okay. Most <laughs> of the disclosure requirements for, for any of these facilities is governed by state law, uh, not by federal law. So they're licensed locally, uh, and the requirements for disclosure, uh, informed consent, will vary from state to state. I am aware of no obligation of an entity to gather uh, additional documentation. I also am aware of none that don't because it makes good sense. I hate to say it this way, but but Amy's company has made a lot of money by marketing common sense because so many entities don't seem to employ it. You would want to have that information available on all of your residents so that you can coordinate the care, you know who to contact with. It wouldn't be a whole lot different than finding out, you know, whether or not there's uh, a living will, whether or not there's a healthcare surrogate agreement, whether or not who somebody has a power of attorney or doesn't have a power of attorney. You need to know that up front because you need to know who's signing on the dotted line at the very beginning to where they even have the ability or, or legal right to sign the documents. So. That happens all the time with arbitration agreements with regard to these entities. You know, the, the argument is, is that the person who signed wasn't authorized to do so. So collecting that kind of information uh, is very, very important. Now, as we discussed, one of the hallmarks of a special needs plan is that your enrollment in a special needs plan is a little bit different than your enrollment in M&A plan. Uh, and you can move in and out of special needs plans easier than you can out of MA plans or into fee for service. And the member can do that. You know, they may not tell the long term care provider or the senior living facility. They may or may not know. Uh, so following up and making sure that you have that data on a at least twice a year basis is probably a good idea. I'm sure, Amy, I'm sure you guys have them do it all the time. <laughs> Well, well, I was going to say, um, when I get the question about, um, hey, what's kind of my first step in developing a value-based care strategy, it typically is, well, you know, do an inventory first, right, of your existing residents. How many are already on it as a Medicare Advantage plan? Who are they with? Who's their primary care doctor? Um, just some of those basics. So I'm glad to hear you say that, hey, <laughs> you don't know of anything that, that certainly prohibits that. Um, but that's kind of step number one and that kind of leads me down the path of, of kind of data collection right and while we work our model um, is flexible where we can work with a lot of types of senior living organizations as a plan there are some things that we are kind of picky about when we're saying who do we want to bring on as a partner but also um how do we want to bring them on as a partner? Um, meaning that on some of those payments that I mentioned, um, if we're going to pay you for care coordination, we're going to need some information about what you're doing around care coordination, for example. Um, we're going to need for you to help participate in letting us know when one of your residents leaves your campus or your AL, for example so that we can make sure and do the follow-up on the back end. So I would encourage all senior living organizations to be thinking about their value-based care strategy. I would also encourage you to kind of go back to the basics and say, hey, are you doing some of these initial things? What are you capable of doing? Because that's, I, I think, going to help you understand who maybe should you be working with and how does it make sense to work with them given your current capabilities, as well as where you want to go in the future. I actually have a question for Amy. So sure. from a traditional Medicare and or let's skip Medicaid for a second, traditional Medicare reimbursement, um, mm -hmm. most of the services that are generally provided in senior living, memory care, et cetera, are not reimbursable, right. correct? Correct. So 
in order to quote unquote bring value, yep. you you have to be willing to do other things or to assist in helping other providers do other things that have the end result of improving the outcomes and the long-term outcomes of the patient, correct? Yeah. So I think um, two things. There are, first of all, there are things that senior living operators are already doing, right? Uh, Care coordination, helping with transportation, for example, things like that. Things you're already doing for your residents. You are not paid under fee for service Medicare. You are not a Medicare provider if you're an assisted living memory care, right? Um, so you're not paid for those by Medicare. That is part of what we can do as Medicare Advantage. We can pay for things that Medicare does not reimburse through supplemental benefits. Um, and then we can also um, bring in um, partners who are providing some of the services that we need to provide to our residents, like transportation, coordination, et cetera. So in a lot of cases, I would say, one, it's the opportunity to be paid for some of those things that you're not paid for today outside of your private fees to your residents. Um, and then two, um, we do have some partners who in some cases have said, hey, if you pay me to do this, I can actually add some benefits or bring in new resources to provide things I'm not doing today for members. So combination of those two. That brings me to um, anytime we're dealing with federal dollars, we, we know that, you know, there, there's some risk associated with yes. those dollars. So I have sort of a two-part question. The first part goes to Kenny. Again, I know I'm not supposed to be asking you legal questions, Kenny, but the, you know, are there legal concerns or risk concerns that you would think about that might surface because of this type of relationship? Yes, obviously there are compliance issues with regulatory compliance and contractual compliance. And then there are issues related to debting and keeping money that you're not supposed to have. So the, th the three big ones, and there are many of these statutes and state law too that might apply to Medicaid or to other uh, avenues in healthcare, but the three big are obviously the False Claims Act or FCA, um, the anti-kickback statute, and the Stark Law. Now, those three in combination with one another uh, are supposed to prevent you uh, from billing and or receiving because you can just just bill and not get paid and still have violated the False Claims Act. Dollars that you're not entitled to. The False Claims Act does not have a scienter or knowledge aspect. So you can do this completely innocently, but if you find out that you did it and you don't give the money back within a relatively short period of time, which I think is 60 days once you are aware of it, you have still violated the act. Uh, and that comes with some sizable penalties to it, in addition to a great deal of headache and then the possible banning from the program, which is uh, far worse on your future revenue. Uh, Stark is a law that is designed to prevent you from uh, referring business to yourself or to relatives uh, primarily. So uh, if you happen to own an acute care facility as an individual, and there are, of course, family-owned hospitals out there that also own, you know, family-owned or relative-owned long-term care facilities, uh, then there are some strict rules that you have to follow before you can refer from one to the other, or you may have violated the Stark Law. Uh, then the anti-kickback law is basically what it suggests. You're, you're not permitted to get things back for recommending things to Medicare beneficiaries. So in those three issues, there are compliance issues associated with it that could land you in some significant hot water, trouble damages, a lot of attorney's fees, and the possible blacklisting from the program completely. The best practice would be that if a community is considering getting involved or partnering, collaborating, of course, they should have their legal counsel, work through the agreements, make sure that they're not 
putting themselves in any situation where they shouldn't be um, entering into a specific agreement. Yes. Rhonda, I would just add on there that um, Medicare Advantage plans are risk products, right? Uh, and that's, we always think of the financial risk first, um, but there is a tremendous amount of regulatory and compliance risk that goes along with Medicare Advantage as well. Um, we are regulated as insurance companies at the state level. Um, so we have state audit requirements. Um, and then we also are, of course, regulated at the federal level through CMS as a CMS program. So as we're talking to new potential partners um, and they are thinking about, you know, how are you going to work with Medicare Advantage plans or, you know, value-based care programs overall. To me, the participation risks and financial benefits kind of go hand in hand with the your ability to successfully manage compliance and regulatory risks. Specifically, what I mean by that is for most senior living partners, and especially those who do not bill today for Medicare services. We strongly recommend that they think about starting by participating with an existing Medicare Advantage plan, special needs plan partner. They yeah. wouldn't have the resources to, to do that. That's right. You don't have the resources, but you're also limited. You're protected from some of those regulatory risks to a certain okay. extent. First of all, through participation, you are going to sign a contract with that Medicare Advantage plan for the services that you are providing. Um, and it is, you know, the Medicare Advantage plan, they need to be paying for the right services. And CMS, by the way, looks at those contracts. So, you know, they give us a heads up if, if there's a concern about it. So you're protected somewhat or a lot, actually, on the regulatory. Um, you are financially and contractually obligated to make sure that you are keeping your end of the contract, right? Uh, so you're doing the things that you're saying in the contract. Um, but all of the other information that the plan is maybe reporting um, in general about your residents, et cetera, that's done in aggregate to CMS. You're not being singled out as a thing, you know, a senior living operator. CMS isn't getting a big dashboard with your name on it and that type of thing. So you've got a fair amount of protection um, from the regulatory risk. You do not have reporting obligations through the plan. You know, it's just like working with most other vendors probably. As you move down that risk spectrum, and again, financial and compliance risk going hand in hand, the next level that we typically talk about is what I call um, the own your own risk program, <laughs> meaning that, that you, um, you have um, upside, potentially downside um, risk for the overall outcomes, um, clinical outcomes of your population. So this is a little bit more complicated contract. Um, it will require careful legal review, obviously, but something that is um, very much allowed under CMS regs today. You're still a participating provider at this point. You don't have to be an owner of the plan to actually receive um, dollars um, based on your the outcomes of your overall population. So I think that's a really important step that a lot of people skip because they think, oh, I can participate, maybe get some pay for performance dollars, or I have to own my own plan so that I can actually, um, you know, get paid based on the clinical outcomes and that medical cost budget. Well, this is all very, very helpful information. And um, I'm trying to keep an eye on the amount of time that we have. Okay, got it. I'll be real fast then. Let me just go to the third one because I, I think sure. that's Absolutely. important. Those who are considering a JV or an ownership model where you are owning the plan, this is where you get into that um, high a uh, regulatory high compliance risk model. So you've, you've invested at the, the state level, your insurance company at the state level, you have state level audits, 
We have um, mandatory CMS financial audits every three years as the plan, multiple regulatory filings that happen with CMS. And you also, a lot of owners or potential owners don't realize this, senior living operators, you also are more heavily regulated if you are a related entity to the plan. What your contract looks like with the plan for services is more regulated than if you were a third party unrelated <laughs> um, provider with the plan. So I'll just stop there. I know we're running out of time, but to me, just think about that financial and compliance risk. Uh, you know, as you move up the spectrum of financial risk, you're also going to have more compliance and regulatory. So, real quick, if we could just recap, I'm going to start with uh, Amy. What um, is the return on investment for senior living operators would be um, in collaborating um, in a relationship uh, with uh, an ISNIP or a special needs program? Sure. So I think the, the first thing I would say to senior living operators is that you do add value. We know it, you know it, your residents know it, you add value to the health and quality outcomes um, for your residents. So claim it claim it now <laughs> and when you do that um, when you find the right partner and uh, again i talk a lot about um, medicare advantage plans special needs plans but it might even be through an aco um, mssp plan etc when you work with value-based care you should expect that your payer partner is funding initiatives that are going to directly impact the quality of life for your residents. They are going to make it more convenient for you and your staff to provide more services on site um, and that there is a real tangible short-term financial benefit back to you when joint goals are met for the residents. So I would look at that as the short term. And then the long term is that as you um, develop longer term relationships with Medicare Advantage or other value-based payers, you should expect to see the benefits accrue kind of year over year. So you should be seeing more benefits for your residents over time. And you should also expect more opportunities if you desire to participate financially with that value-based payer. So as you become more experienced and you get more data, you should be able to have more options in what you want to take on in terms of caring for your residents or providing services for your residents versus what your um, plan partner is, is providing. Very, very informative. Kenny, to end this conversation, what do you think are the glaring um, insurance implications for a SNP plan or ISNIPs? Other than the, the the obvious needs that everybody would think of, the PNC needs for property and casualty, the licensed medical provider coverage, HPL, cyber uh, and and cyber risk associated particularly with HIPAA and with uh, personal identifiable information as well as financial information which the entities have. You run into things where people um, do not understand that their HPL product that provides essentially for medical malpractice coverage doesn't normally cover them for managed care operations. So if they are performing utilization review, if they are engaged in credentialing at all, if they are participating in quality assurance or other things that fall outside of the actual uh, definition of provision of medical services in an HPL policy, then they're they're flying without insurance, which is a risk that they would normally not think of from a administrative services organization or an MSO organization, they often think of everything as being financial. So if they have their financial institution coverage, they think that they're okay. They forget that they could be become a defendant in a bodily injury claim, and they don't normally have coverage for that. So the reverse is also true. The biggest hole out there is the regulatory coverage. 
the further along that line that Amy was describing before from just being a contracted provider all the way to becoming a direct contracting entity with CMS, the further along that line you get, the more regulatory entanglements you can have. And that requires a specialized amount of coverage because most policies will have regulatory coverage, but it usually is sublimited. So there's very little of it. Um, and these things can take on a life of their own, particularly in, in uh, larger institutions. And that coverage is not normally thought of uh, as a separate coverage that's necessary. So those are the main things that I'd bring to people's attention. Amy, did you want to add any final comments or thoughts um, before we wrap up? No, I don't have anything else, Rhonda. I think y'all have done a great job of um, making sure that your clients um, are um, well informed about their options, and I appreciate being part of the conversation. We appreciated having you today, Amy. Thank you so much for sharing all of that knowledge and expertise. And Kenny, we always appreciate you participating. The Senior Living Center of Excellence really appreciates um, both of your time today. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. And for a shameless plug, the Willis Towers Watson Healthcare Risk Conference is July 19th through the 21st in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, day one is senior living and long-term care focused. Parts of day two and three are managed care and health system focused. Uh, so you're invited to join us in Nashville in July, uh, and we look forward to seeing you there. Good points, Kenny. Thanks for sharing that. Really appreciate that. That will be found on our WTW CO um, Senior Living webpage as well as the Health Practice um, webpage. So um, for our clients, they should be receiving an, an invite for that. I want to thank all of you today for attending our podcast. Special thanks again to the panelists. Um, we hope you found our information very helpful. Our goal is really to provide firsthand information and knowledge um, and best practice for our senior living providers. If you'd like additional information on ISIP plans, again, our um, information of our panelists will be found on our podcast page. Um, or feel free to reach out to me, Rhonda. Domino at WTWCO.com. Keep in mind, this was a three-part series. This is the third episode to that series. We hope you um, had time to join the first two podcasts as well. This concludes today's podcast. Again, thanks to Amy and Kenny for their time today, and thanks to all who have attended this event. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this WTW podcast featuring the latest perspectives on the intersection of people, capital, and risk. For more information, visit the Insights section of WTWCO.com. WTW hopes you found the general information provided in this podcast informative and helpful. The information contained herein is not intended to constitute legal or other professional advice and should not be relied upon in lieu of consultation with your own legal advisors. In the event you would like more information regarding your insurance coverage, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. In North America, WTW offers insurance products through licensed entities, including Willis Towers Watson Northeast Incorporated in the United States and Willis Canada Incorporated in Canada. <music>